Okay, Matias, say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so uh, talk to us a little bit about your journey. Maybe start with Biotab um, and uh, take, take that journey from then, the exit, and then ultimately to, uh, to current state. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. I'm, I think I find myself, I, I consider myself to be very fortunate. I've had an interesting career so far, and a lot of it has been to do with, I think, just luck and, and that type of stuff, which I think a lot of people fall into that category. Um, I, I started um, off at university. I had an idea to start a company where the consumer brands could use digital gift cards. And that seems like a, a commonplace thing today, but I can tell you, you know, 14 years ago, that wasn't a thing. Like yeah. people thought, looked at me sideways and thought it was pretty crazy to have this idea where you could issue a digital gift card to somebody. So I'm the student at university and I really did, wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I had a, an inclining for finance and I was going down a finance path and uh, like it was in business school studying finance. And if you asked me at the time, I probably thought that I was going to end up working in a bank or something. And it's funny, like I always, I've always considered myself like pretty risk averse, um, but then I've done things that have not been so risk averse, which I, I think is a good quality in an entrepreneur. Actually, I think it's, I think the best entrepreneurs are pretty, or at least the ones I've met are quite risk adverse, but they're very calculated in the risks they take. Um, anyways, I was a student at university, a young kid, and I had this idea where I thought consumer brands should issue uh, digital gift cards. Um, and, and to me, that made sense. And it, it actually came from a problem I ran into. And it's, it's a bit of a funny problem. So me and a friend at the time needed to get uh, need to give like a, a gift to somebody who was in Chicago at the time. So the person was in Chicago, they were going to go for dinner and it was the day of their birthday. And we thought, well, let's get, let's pay for a hundred dollars of their meal. And we know they're going to this restaurant. So we called down to the, to the restaurant and we talked to the server there and I guess it wasn't busy. And the server goes, what do you want to do? And we go, well, we want to give you a credit card and then want to pay you a hundred dollars. And then when they come in, you want you to take a hundred bucks off their bill. And she's like, what? Like, I can't do this for you. Uh, but she was like really nice. And she goes, um, let me try to see what I can do. So again, I'm a student at university, right? And she puts me on hold for like half an hour, comes back and says, you know what, kid, I, I think I can help you. Why don't you fax me over both sides of your credit card and both sides of your ID and I can probably pull us off for you. And I go like fax machine, like how am I going to fax anything? I don't even know how to use one of those things, right? So I realized quickly, like there has to be a solution for this. People need to be able to gift things consumer brands want to do this stuff. So built a company around helping consumer brands issue digital gift cards. Uh, that was like a, a very great thing. And I was really proud of where that all led to, but it was all like, you know, it was like 13 years of building a company. By the end of it, we were cash flow positive. We had, we had done a few financing rounds in the earlier years, but we got to a point where we were cash flow positive. We had great clients. We had signed up companies the size of Walmart and Whole Foods in the four seasons and hundreds, hundreds of really great brands. And we were the, the we, you know, that, that company is still the platform for those brands to sell digital gift cards. Through that process, we had this vision and, and like I learned a lot of this, too, all of it along the way, right? But uh, we had this vision of just making the world more digital and progressing the adoption of digital gift cards. And we, we felt we got, we got to a point where it made all the sense in the world to hand it over to a strategic acquire. And, and we can go into more details on what that process was like, but we ended up selling the company and now it's owned by the large incumbent in the whole like, you know, gift card uh, prepaid space, which we were really proud of. And it was, it was a really great outcome. But yeah, so back to me, uh, young kid, university, have this idea. I don't really know what I'm going to do. And then just like went through like the, 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 the school of starting a company, hiring people, building it out, getting customers, to iterating, 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 all the way to exit. And, um, you know, from there I continued to, I continued to just like love the community I was in, like invest in other entrepreneurs. Um, so I'm an investor in, in other early stage companies and, and a few of them are doing really well. And then now uh, I'm, I'm the CEO and the, and a founder in a company called ethos where we're helping consumer brands learn about digital assets and NFTs for the first time. And, you know, now when I talk about digital gift cards, people don't look at me weird, but when I talk to them about NFTs and web three and digital assets, they look at me you know, as weird as they did, you know, 14 years ago, I was talking about digital gift cards. There's a, yeah. there's a long kind of like context for you, but hopefully that hits on some of the key highlights. Oh, absolutely. I got a ton of questions. So, so first off, let's go back to, to buy a tab. Um, and well, it really kind of keeps in mind, even the context in which you're, you're relating with your customers today. So 
What is your experience over a decade long experience of working with big brands and consumers teach you about human behavior? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say a few things. One of the things I would say is that consumer brands, they really care about their customers, like they, especially the ones that have done well. They really care about their customers and they care about all their customers. And I say that very intentionally because all of their customers include people who are very uh, like literate with technology and the people who also aren't, right? Like I have friends that work in construction and like never use email and are very like, you know, on their phones. My point is like, I think a lot of people that work in technology and especially folks like me who like have grown up in it and like live on the coast, we get a skewed view of the world. And I think consumer brands do a really good job of understanding that all of their customers are important. And when they're thinking about solutions and adopting new technology, they're looking at something that's going to delight all of their customers, not just a small subset. So um, that, that's one of the things I'd say. I would say that one of the things I think large companies get unfairly kind of, um, you know, tar or, uh, tagged with is that they're like slow. I think, I think that can be true for sure. But I, I know a lot of great companies that try a lot of things are very iterative and for the size they are, they move quite quick. So I, I really think that it's a bad uh, assumption to make that large companies are slow because they're large. I think they're just thinking of things in a different way um, because there's a lot of smart people that work at those companies. Sure, sure. What, what about on the consumer side? Yeah, on the consumer side, I think a, a good friend of mine, in, he's a finance guy, he always says that people like it's all about convenience and they'll pay for convenience, right? And it's not even just dollars that they'll pay for convenience, but um, I think consumers are, are wildly, um, like they widely value convenience. And I think people in technology often forget that. I'll give you an example. My wife, who like, I, I love her so much and like she's taught me so many things. She's like, she's way different than I am. Like she's not in like technology the way I am. Um, but she's also like, you know, on Instagram and like on TikTok and like she's very, uh, she uses her phone better than I do. And like, I've seen her sit in front of our computer. Like I've seen her sit in front of our computer on her phone, like doing online banking. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, I'm like sending somebody some money or I'm like checking whatever. And I go, but why aren't you using the computer? She goes, oh, because it's like easier on my phone. And I'm like, you're sitting in a chair where the computer's right there and it's, it's marginally easier for you to use your phone. So you'll use your phone. So, so I, I think we live in a world where consumers are so, um, like, I guess, like convenience is the thing that matters and everything else is like a, a far second and third. So that's kind of the, the biggest takeaway I would say from consumers. And, and I think specifically in this technology space I'm in now with Web3 and, and blockchain, I think a lot of people don't realize that. I think a lot of people think consumers are going to store cryptic keys. They're going to have all these like crypto wallets. They're going to be like exchange tokens. And I'm like, have you, have you, have you met other people than you? Right. Yeah. I, I can't get my wife to, to use the computer to do all my banking because it's more easier on her phone. Like, you know, and then you start thinking about your aunts and uncles and stuff like this. Yeah, I, I think uh, convenience is so, so important when it comes to thinking about the customer, especially when it comes to technology. Yeah, man, it's it's almost like everyone wants, you remember that big red easy button that they used to have like as a joke, you'd hit it and forget if, if that was Target or somebody like that, but it's almost like everybody has one of those in front of them all day, every day now. Access, yeah, easy buttons. And, and like we're thinking about, oh man, that easy button's in the other room. It's I wish I could just like <laughs> use my voice to hit the easy button, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. Yep, you're not kidding. So, so, um, you know, you mentioned something about um, next generation of your vision or something along those lines around connecting Biotab and what you've done and the business you sold, which I do want to go back to because there's a lot of lessons learned, I'm sure, from your exit. But before we do that, I want to connect that vision that you had at Biotab to what you're doing now at Ethos. And it's almost uh, a continuation the way I see it in the what from what I've heard you talk about in getting brands to invest in digital assets now as a reward platform utilizing you know nfts in this case so what yeah. um can you speak a little bit to that for sure for sure and um so I, again i was like this student at university when i started by time and i didn't really know anything right and i learned a ton and i'm so grateful for the entrepreneurial journey which is like a fire hose of learning right um one of the things i learned along the way was one of my like deepest passions, which is, you know, call me weird or whatever, but I really like introducing people to new technology, specifically 
people that are working at large consumer brands because they have such an opportunity to do so much with new technologies. And they're also like motivated to do it. And, and there just takes like education and like, you know, like building it out in a way that makes sense for their customers where it can really take off. So what I learned along the way was I really enjoy helping consumer brands adopt new technologies. And I did that at Biotab. Like at Biotab, we were helping consumer brands adopt digital gift cards for the first time. And we did some really great work there. And we ended up like being one of the key players in, in a very large growing industry. And when that kind of like came to, to an end for me, the company's still around and like they're doing great and everything else. But when it came to an end for me, it's like we did all the education, like the company, the, the, the market had kind of changed into be more kind of like common form now that every merchant sells digital gift cards now. But that left me going, I love helping consumer brands use new technology to get closer to their customers and also just like use their power to like progress things. And at the same time, like, you know, I've always, you know, over the past couple of years, I've always watched blockchain and crypto. And I, I've always seen that as like the next important technology. And, you know, when it was really just when the most obvious use case for blockchain was cryptocurrencies, I didn't really see a spot for me, right? Like I was like, okay, I'll hold some Ethereum. I have some Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. This stuff's interesting. I think there's a lot of under a lot of benefits this under technology can do, but I didn't really see a home for me in it. And then when NFTs came around and I started to really understand NFTs and digital assets, I was like, oh, wow, this is the ability for individuals to have ownership in digital items. And then I was like, wow, well, if you can have ownership of digital items, you're of course going to want, like, if we spend time in digital environments today, you know, which we all agree we are, we're like literally all on right now, we're going to spend more time in digital environments in the future. People like totally buy into that too. Um, well, we're going to want to have some sovereignty. We're going to own things. And if this technology exists now where we can actually own digital items, like this is an important thing. And I'm thinking, well, what are these consumer brands thinking about this? And you ask a consumer brand and they go like, what is, like, what are you talking about, dude? Right? So. Yeah. So, so my passion that I, I had realized and really kind of leaned into at my last company is like in full, full gear here, right? It's like, we want to help consumer brands adopt digital assets so they can build better relationships with their customers. And we walk into meetings and people don't know what this is and they need, they want to learn and, and we help educate them and we run projects with them and all that kind of stuff. But it is that underlying passion of mine that is to help consumer brands use new technology, which is, which fuels me and, you know, gets me to jump out, out of bed in the mornings and Maybe that's not what would fuel others, but for me, it's, it's like what I'm really excited to do. So what, uh, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges or, you know, inhibitors towards adoption, if you will? Yeah, there's a few things. I think that, um, there's a lot of technical challenges that need to be resolved for adoptions to show up. Um, there's a thing called crossing the chasm. Are, are you familiar with that crossing the chasm kind of leap? Very. Um, yeah, right. Where like the first adopters are like pretty easy to get on board because like they want to try something new. They like will do the research. They'll go through the challenges. But to cross the chasm, you have to like make it crazy, crazy simple. And it's a total different type of person that you're selling it to. I think there's a lot of crossing the chasm that has to happen here. I think that the, uh, you know, the numbers have been quite large, especially last year in terms of how many transactions have happened with NFTs and, and that type of stuff. But, but that's all with that left side of the chasm, right? If we want to get the people on the right side, we're going to have to make it so simple that they don't even know what they're interacting with is an NFT and connected to the blockchain. So I think on the technical front, I think we have to make it so simple for people and also bring them joy that otherwise wouldn't be possible with, without this technology. So we're busy at work doing a lot of that stuff and innovating a lot there. Others are doing this too. Others are doing stuff like this too. And we hope they're successful and we hope we're successful because the big thing here is the more commonplace NFTs and digital assets become and the easier they become for the, for everybody, the more everyone's going to benefit, right? So I'll give you just a quick example. One thing that we're really excited about is, you know, we've integrated the ability to display NFTs that we're issuing into Apple Wallet. So, so you don't have to have some crypto, you could, you know, you don't have to have a crypto wallet. You can display it in your Apple wallet like you would a boarding pass and you can purchase very easily with like PayPal or something like that. So we're trying to make it like we're innovating a lot and investing a lot in making that technical, uh, those technical innovations to make this technology a lot easier. So I think that's one thing. And I think that's something that everyone in the space needs to look at themselves hard in the mirror and say, how are we making this easier for people? And how do we innovate there? And when, you know, when we complain that there's not what, what mainstream adoption, 
we only really have ourselves to blame because we got to make it easier and easier and easier. So that's kind of one point. Another point is we are kind of climbing up a hill here <laughs> unfairly I, with FTX and like that stuff in the news and all these. It's been like really unfortunate how many bad actors have kind of tainted this space. Um, I often joke that it would be easier to start from a point where nobody recognized what NFTs or digital assets were rather than where we are now. Cause like you have SPF on the news being arrested and like stealing a bunch of people's money and then us walking into a boardroom going, Hey, you should think about NFTs and, and digital assets. And they go, isn't this stuff like illegal dude? And they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> like it's ownership of digital items. That curly haired guy is like something completely different. So I, I think we're unfairly kind of having to climb over a hill um, that was um, you know, created by others, but you know, it, it is what it is. And I, I think that as we create more utility filled use cases, and as more brands adopt this and create really great experiences for their customers, we will do both those things, right? We will, you know, show people that this is awesome technology and it can create really great experiences for people and we'll make it really easy. So they'll not only hear about that, but they'll see it firsthand. Well, and you're going to look back in a few years and be so thankful for this thing with FTX and SBF and all this stuff, even though it's challenging now, it's going to weed out so many of the phonies in the space, uh, it, just given the, the way hype cycles do. Right. So I think eventually yeah. you'll be thankful since you're a builder and you're a great builder. So you're going to build and you're going to build and others are going to fall and it's going to be, it's going to end up in a good shape for you. But yeah, it's turbulent times, man. Turbulent times. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I like, I feel like I'm here for, it's going to sound a bit cheesy. I'm really enjoying what we're doing because I'm, I know what this technology can, like it has the potential to do. And I know that if there's enough people that are working hard at it with good intentions, it's just, it's all going to come through. Right. And, you know, it, so when you look at it from that lens, it's kind of the same thing you're saying, which is like, you know, you don't get down by that stuff. You just go, well, it's going to be funny to think back. Remember when like that happened and buddy was on the news and people thought it was all scam. It's like, okay. Great. Or, or maybe from the opposite lens, you remember when everyone threw millions and millions and millions at things that they had no idea what they were throwing it at. And then we're surprised about the reaction on the other end, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But I think if you, I think like, you know, people that talk about like Warren Buffett, about how steady he's been and with it, like his convictions and how he like has written his beliefs all the way into like where he is now. I, I think there are recipes that work in the long, long run. And I think one recipe is like, regardless of hype, you know, build things that give people joy and provide people better experiences that they will like. And, you know, you might be in a hype cycle and, and, and like be annoyed that there's so many other people getting attention, or you may be in a, in a real downturn where like people are real, the sentiment's really negative. But if you just follow that line long enough, I think you make your own luck. I think it's, you know, as long as you're kind of deep in your conviction there. Yeah, that's completely, completely agree. So on that note in, in building trust and, and in particular, the trust that build b big brands, sorry, need to build with consumers. What do you think are the most important elements for those big brands to be able to build trust with consumers? Yeah, yeah, great question. And, and by the way, this is why we named the company Ethos, right? It's like trust is so important around getting people to try new technologies and people to and like step in because it can be scary for sure. So what can brands do? A couple of things. We tell brands like, hey, when you're doing one of these programs and you're going to now introduce digital assets, so you're going to either sell a digital asset, or you're going to give one away for free. You got to remember that who is going to participate, right? And the answer is, you know, and they like hearing this, like a lot of new people, so that's great. But who's also going to participate are your best customers. There, there are brands that you follow, um, Jim, that you would follow, you know, no matter what they're doing, right? And if you're a brand and you're going to do something and it's going to be, the, the people that are going to, you know, interact with that or participate are going to be your best customers. Well, you better do it well. And if you're going to do it well, what that means is like, you better enrich it, like, and make it very valuable for them. Right. And I'm not just talking monetary. So when we're telling a brand to issue or to sell a digital asset, we go, you could do a digital asset X brand and it'll be exciting and people will participate. But let's, let's over index on the benefits and the perks the customer gets. Right. So like, if you know it's going to be your best customer, let's fill it with utility, like free shipping on their, on, on their subsequent purchases, like access to special products that other people haven't gotten, right? 
like, you know, special time with the person who's creating the products that you're doing or, or, or the, these types of things or an event that you're hosting. But anyway, so like one of the big things that these brands can do is to c come in authentically knowing that, hey, my best customers are going to engage in this. You know, let me over index on benefits they're going to get. Because if a brand comes in and says, hey, we have a great profile, we're going to sell an NFT and it's just going to be an image and there's going to be no value. Sure, you're going to sell some, but in the long run, you're hurting your brand, you're hurting your customers. Whereas, you know, alternatively, another brand could say, hey, we're going to do this and we're going to just jam fill it with utility because we know it's our best customers that are going to participate and we're going to reward them because when they look back five years from now, they're going to say, hey, like that brand wanted me to do something. I did it and look at all the benefits I'm getting. So that's one of the things. Another thing they can do if they want to like lower the risk on it is we have a, a great tool where a brand can issue an NFT out for free. And so they don't have to sell it because traditionally when you think of an NFT, you think of buying one. So a brand could sell an NFT, but another great way to engage and, and to get new customers to participate is to issue NFTs for free. And you don't have to, you can, we encourage a utility on all the NFTs, but you don't have to go so crazy on the utility when you're giving away for free. Like Jim, if, if one of your favorite brands gave you a free digital asset that gave you you know, a coupon code or something, and you didn't pay for that, you just got it. You'd be like, this is really cool. I'm, you know, I feel rewarded. I feel appreciated. And you'd have a better sentiment to NFTs, but you'd also have a better connection to the, to the brand too. Does that all make That's sense? Great. Yeah. That, a hundred. Yeah. It makes, it makes complete sense. I'm sure people are nodding their heads, <laughs> listening in agreement right now. So, so on that same note, what, what strategies are you guys employing at Ethos to ensure that your brands and your consumers that are working with brands have a positive experience? Yeah, so we only work with brands that look at this from that lens, right? Like we're only looking to work with consumer brands that want to reward their customers and, you know, provide them something. Luckily, most successful, like, like if you're a successful consumer brand, you want to take good care of your customers, right? This is one of the things I love about consumer brands is that, like I said at the beginning, is like they do a great job of knowing who their customers are and rewarding them. So the brands we work with see this as, hey, we want to participate. We want to do something new. We want to attract a new type of demographic. We want to reward our existing customers. And we partner with them on kind of really like a bunch of things, but two things in primary. It's like one, well, let's make this really easy. Let's make this so, you know, a, a crypto you know, expert can, can participate and, and, and participate in the way that they want to participate. But then you're like the rest of your customers, which is the other 99%, let's make it really easy for them too. And if we think if we can make it really, really simple for both, it'll be a very joyful thing. So, 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 so that's one. And then the second thing is like, well, you know, you as a brand have like special IP, you have special events, you have special like things that you can, you can include. So let's, let's fill it with utility and let's make it so that when that person receives that NFT, or that digital asset, they are like, this is awesome. Like, like my, my favorite brand just sent me this. It was really easy for me to receive. It looks really cool. I can add it to my Apple wallet. And like, now I get like first in line access to like their special product that I had to line up for before. Right. And, and if that all comes true as the customer, you go, I like this. Like, I like this. <laughs> I like this brand. I like what they did here. It's, it's a innovative approach towards driving value on both ends. I mean, it's, it's uh that's very very clear i want to i want to come back to this in a second but i also sure. want to journey back because i promised the audience yeah. a little bit of talk about exit right everyone yeah. loves talking about exit not a lot of people talk about exit lessons learned so i'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about you know as you were going through that exit um, of buy a tab some of the emotions that you went through some of the mistakes that you might have made some of the things that the, the dirt, if you will, that you went through. I'm just going to go ahead and leave it at that and, and give you the floor. Yeah, yeah. I could talk forever about this and I, I, I am happy you kind of loop back to this. So I'd say a couple of things. I'd say there's a misunderstanding about tech exits. And the best way I think I can describe it is like they very rarely happen unintentionally, right? So people think that like build this company and then someone comes knocking on your door and says, I'll buy it for a bunch of money. Like literally this is what people think, right? And it's like yeah. your house. Like I'm sure, yes, in some cases, somebody knocked on someone's door and offered them a ton of money for their house that was not listed on the market, right? But the vast majority is not that. The vast majority is, you know, you get the house all prepped and like you, you hire a realtor and like you, you put it out there and like you know, people come look at it and then you sell the house, right? So I would say that 
you know, if, if, if you're thinking of like progressing your business and, and you're working towards an exit, you need to be intentional. Right. It's like it's only going to serve you well and, and, and serve your customers well and serve your employees well if you're intentional about it. Right. For us, I can, I can share with you kind of like some of the background there is like, you know, at my last company, the idea was we wanted to advance uh, digital gift cards. We wanted to make more of an impact, land bigger customers and just accelerate growth. And we were doing great, but we wanted to accelerate that further. And we got to a point. So that was our kind of like our, our, our driving factor, which. I'm a big believer in companies having like a vision that they're chasing and then everything else supports that, right? So for us, that was the vision that we were chasing and we were trying to support that. And we got to a point just because of who, the company we were, the space we were in and the incumbents that we were in, that we got to a point where it made sense to partner with one of the large incumbents because our reach would get wider and we could do more and we could have a bigger impact, right? So we backed into, okay, well, I guess we're going to need to like, you know, hand this company off to a strategic partner, not because we wanted to like sell it necessarily. And like, sure, like that's all good. And everyone li likes to hear like people sold for money and all that kind of stuff. Right. But it was more about, okay, if we hand it off to the right partner, you know, this thing's going to grow way more. Like it's going to grow e even further. It's going to be a better outcome for employees. It's going to be stabler, stabler. It's going to be better jobs, more opportunities to like advance. It's going to be a better opportunity for our customers because now you're going to have, you know, this really large company funding and helping grow more, more pieces of it. And we're going to accelerate our, to, you know, towards our, our vision here. So for us, it was like, okay, we got to a point where we knew that that was going to need to happen. We had a really great board and we really thought through, okay, well, if that's one of the things we need to kind of work towards, you know, we made sure we were prepared. And, you know, when we ended up selling to the large incumbent, people think like, you know, from without the uneducated person about us, would think that they came and knocked on our door, but that wasn't the case. Like we had built a relationship. We knew that that's, that was the right kind of strategic partner. And we were really happy with the outcome and it worked. It accelerated the, the company further. And uh, yeah, so hopefully there, there's some good nuggets there, Jim. And hopefully I hit on some of the things you wanted me to hit on. Oh, you did, but we ain't done. So, so exiting is this big life event is kind of part of what you're saying, right? It's, it's, not, it's not just this happy yellow brick road journey. It's something that number one needs to be planned for. And number two, it hits home because it's kind of your life for a while while you're building and growing a business, right? Talk through some of the emotions that you went through on that journey. Yeah, I actually think like the answer to all of it is if it's supporting something larger than you, right? Like I went through all those emotions like, oh man, like I'm going to lose con like some control, like, like you lose control, you lose all this stuff because you're selling the company, right? But, you know, and it's like, oh, this is my baby. Like what happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? But it, all those questions get easier to answer your, in, like internally when you go, yeah, but this is going to be better. Like this is going to be better for the company. The company will be bigger. The company will have more opportunity. But if you're not chasing a, a, a bigger vision and, and you're looking at an exit of your company with, in the absence of that, I think it's, pro it's probably really easy to get like really hung up on those smaller details. But for me, it was like, okay, well, like it'll be a good financial win. Nice. Right. But also you know, all these other things now you kind of categorize as reservations, you, they, they can easily get kind of like, okay, but this is gonna be better for everyone else. And I get the financial win and it's better for everybody. And then so the, for me on a personal level, it was all good, right? Like it was like, it was a natural progression because it was contributing to something that we had set out from the very beginning to be larger, right? Um, and, and that I think makes it transformationally easier because otherwise you look at it like your entire Thing is being taken away from you, right? Right, right. When you were thinking about the the right partner, right? I think you said the the right strategic buyer. You said some some words along those lines. But when you were looking for that right person to sell to, what are some things that you kept in mind about who that company was? How'd you decide who they they were the best partner, so on and so forth? Yeah, for sure. So I looked at it. I, I try to boil things down to like you know, three things usually. I looked at it in, in that sense, we were looking at it from, okay, well, there's three, you know, important stakeholders that we got to keep in mind, right? So it was our employees, our customers, and our shareholders. And, and it was like, okay, who makes the most sense? And if you was a score scorecard, right? Like, you know, let's give a rating on how well this strategic partner lines up from like, how will this be good for our employees? How will this be good for our customers? How will this be good for shareholders? And obviously shareholders want to get paid. So like, right. But I'll tell you that like, that doesn't, that matrix doesn't lead you to only picking the highest bidder, 
right? Because if somebody is slightly lower on price, but they're going to like not shut down the office, not fire the employees and like not sunset a bunch of your products. I'll tell you any, any founder worth their kind of like salt will pick, you know, slightly lower financial for that, that. So that, that was our, that was our matrix. And again, like I really dig into this stuff because I, I think there's a lot of great entrepreneurs out there that don't think about like, they're very thoughtful on every, every aspect of their business. And then they fail to be thoughtful on transitioning it or selling it or like that part of it. And, and then they read a headline and they think somebody just knocked on the door of that company and bought them. Right. So it, uh, the big takeaway, at least from my vantage point, has been like, you have to be intentional because it impacts you in a big way, but it also impacts so many other people that you care about. And if you're not going to be intentional about it, you know, sure, maybe you get the outcome you were hoping for without having any, like, without being intentional about it. But I don't know. I haven't seen it happen that way. Were, were there, I mean, I haven't either, I haven't either, except maybe <laughs> once or twice in the most random situation. It's, but it's, it's not. <laughs> And by the way, in both those situations, they probably could have gotten rated higher on at least one area, if not all areas of your matrix, if they yeah. had gone out and actually run a real process and looked at this from a lens of what I like to call transferable value or right value in the eye of the buyer, which ultimately translates to what you mentioned with employees, customers, and shareholders. So, but but there's there's got to be at least one lesson learned in here that that you wish you knew in advance of driving towards the exit. Anything, any, anything that stands out in terms of lessons learned? Yeah, I would say that you need to create an environment where you're thinking about this stuff. And, and like, I'm in it right now, right? Like, I know how crazy it is to be like day to day in an oper operating business. It's really hard, actually, to like be in an environment, like remove yourself periodically and think through, okay, well, what do we want this thing to look like a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? And I think it's, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. And then also sometimes it, you know, it can be driven by, you know, forces that you may want to be like resistant against. Like maybe you raise money and you have an investor who's like now pushing that and you go, well, like, I think it's actually quite hard to, and we were lucky. We were in a position where we had a really strong board. We had a very a constructive environment where that environment, where, where that environment existed. Like, like we would have quarterly board meetings and we would think through these things in a very safe and very thoughtful way. And, and whether it's advisors, whether it's a formal board, whether it's like, you know, somebody going on like a trip, you know, twice a year on their own or whatever, it's like, think through where you want the business to go, why, and what steps you would take to get there. And uh, yeah, I think the most structured way and the way that worked well for me was like, have a well-functioning board with a diverse set of opinions and people that are like supportive and also challenge you. And then have that environment where you're thinking through this stuff. Because, you know, we were building, like, we would have kept building a great business. We would have kept landing customers. We would have kept doing what we were doing, but we wouldn't have been able to kind of inflect the business without those strategic thoughts. And that stuff didn't, that stuff took years to play out, right? So, so I would say that the big piece there is like, be intentional, create an environment where you can think through these things and, and then kind of chart a pathway towards them. So connecting all these awesome thoughts about where you were to, to where you are now, what, What's the plan with Ethos? Where, 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 are you, where are you guys headed? Yeah, yeah. I'm like so passionate about this. And it's, it's funny, like we're building a Web3 blockchain company and I feel like it's my least purpose and it sounds kind of crazy, right? Because like, what are you talking about, dude? Here's what I think. I think that the world is moving more digital. Like I think, Jim, you and I, in 10 years or in 20 years, we will be way more using digital devices than we even are now. And we use them a ton now. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like, there's no question. And I got a, a one and a half year old. And when he's 20, like, it's going to be crazy. Like how much, you know, more like, you know, the, the more immersed he is in technology is going to be like, it's going to dwarf even what we're in now. A big belief I have is like, we're heading into this direction where it's only going to be more digital for us. And I think that's a pretty safe kind of observation. The second thing I'd say is that those digital environments that we're going to spend time in, they're going to be more immersive. Right. So those digital environments will be more immersive. They'll be more real. Like we will. So, so one, we will spend more time engaging in that type of stuff. And two, when we're engaging in that type of stuff, it'll be more real, higher resolution, more immersive. Maybe it's like a full room and all that kind of stuff. Right. So in, in that scenario where those two things come true, which I'm like, I'm like fully confident. I'm like, you know, like fully behind that happening. 
And it's actually not hard to even get the most skeptic to believe those two things. Like anybody who's even skeptical will, will sign up to, yes, more digital <laughs> device usage and more, it, it'd be more immersive. So if you fast forward to when that happens, like we're still human beings. Like we're going to want to represent ourselves with like clothing, with like hats and like shoes and avatars and like skins. Like we're going to want to ourselves like we like represent ourselves in physical worlds. We're also going to want to like actually own things. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's, I think it's crazy that we spend today a bunch of time in digital environments and a bunch of time in physical environments. And we all do this, but in the physical environments, we actually own things like for real. I have things I can sell to you. I have things that are truly mine. And in the digital world, we don't really own anything. So I think that as we progress more into a more digital environment, more digital future, it's going to be really important actually that individuals own their own digital. And, and, there, and I don't know, I've not been presented a better way than using blockchain to do that. So by registering digital assets on blockchain that's this ledger that nobody controls and is available to everybody it creates this like you it creates a environment where that digital asset is truly yours and you can transfer it to different places and if we fast forward to an environment where we're more digital those environments are more immersive we're going to want to own things and i think it's going to be really important that companies like ethos succeed because if they don't, we're just going to end up like in Zuckerberg's metaverse where we don't own anything and it's all theirs and they, we can't move it anywhere, right? So, so I actually think like what we're doing contributes to a really important cause, which is one where we can have like things that we own in digital environments. And when I'm talking about digital environments, I'm not talking necessarily about metaverses. I'm talking about like, you know, video games. I'm talking about like things we even do now, right? You know, you buy a Ford Bronco, it's in your driveway. You go play a video game. Like, why isn't it there, right? Like you paid for it right? If I have like a, a cool jacket, why can't I wear it in a Zoom call? Like I paid for it, right? So yeah, so 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 I know it's a, kind of a long answer, but I would say that very passionate about what I'm doing because I think that, you know, we're heading into a future where it's more digital and that future I think will be way better is if we can own things that we care about and, and specifically where we're helping is consumer brands. You are an inspiration, my friend. So oh, uh, or we're crazy, but um, yeah. I mean, we'll or, or, we'll or both. I mean, isn't that kind yeah. of, it, if you look up entrepreneur in the dictionary, isn't lunatic the, the synonym you see first? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think you got to be is, a lunatic. By the way, I, I was at an event last, I was at an event last night and it was an awesome event and everything else, but it, 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 like there were some successful entrepreneurs that I, I felt made it too, made it, made it come off to others. It was an easy journey. And it might have been an easy journey for them, but it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. So, you know, maybe, maybe all entrepreneurs are a bit crazy because to do it, it's a hard undertaking. Well, I think we're also encouraged that we need to be superhuman and we need to talk about it like it's easy, right? Like you talk yeah. to a professional athlete, they don't talk about being, being the best in their game as being easy, right? They don't, they don't think yeah. that you're supposed to talk like that. But for whatever reason, an entrepreneur goes to an event like you're talking about and they, it's ingrained in them that they're supposed to act like everything's great. The world, the world is on fire, but everything in my company is perfect. But that's not yeah. even true. It's like, right. it's like, I know, I know you're, you're hitting on such an important point. I think that's one of the things that like, you know, think people think positive and negative about Elon Musk. But one of the things that I think he does, which is good is he's very honest about it. Like I think he says, and he's been one of the most successful entrepreneurs of our time. He says that entrepreneurship is like chewing glass while staring into the abyss. Right. So he's definitely not doing what the others are doing. But I agree with you. I, I do think that's a problem. I think that entrepreneurs should be more honest and just say, hey, um, it, there's obviously a tendency to make it sound easier and like super great, but be more honest around like, hey, the outcome is amazing. Like, like there's no question. If you can impact people's lives in a positive way and have a great potential, like that's amazing. But the process is, and, and I think being more upfront about how hard the process is, I think is only helpful to people. Hands down. And, and it's why people like you and I keep chewing glass in Elon's world, right? It's, it's, uh, once you start chewing glass, I guess you can't go back. You, it's crazy. Like we got acquired by such a great company, huge, you know, Fortune 100, like treated us great. And then like I gave it up to go chew glass, right? Like <laughs> it's like yep. you'd only do that though, because you know that like on the other end, it, it's like the best feeling in the world, right? But yeah, yeah, you got to yeah. be. Uh, all right. So from from chewing glass to now closing things off, I want to I want to do so with the, what we do in every episode, which is our founder five. So founder five is just five quick hit questions about your growth. 
we're gonna roll th- we're gonna roll through them real quick. So the first one is number one metric or KPI that you are relentlessly focused on. Yeah. So this one's revenue. I, I think revenue is such an important metric. And I've I've talked a lot about this actually, especially in that uh, some tech companies, a pet peeve I have is that, you know, they'll just focus on developing product and, and not chase revenue. I think revenue is such an important metric. One, because you know, you're never gonna get away from being measured about like at some point on your revenue, right? So yeah. you kind of focus on revenue. But I, I think revenue is such an important metric because it's the market giving you feedback. So if you are creating something and you're garnering, you're earning revenue as a result, it's the market saying what you're doing is right. And revenue is like, you know, you launch a new feature and people sign up for it and they start paying you for it. Well, guess what? This is the market saying, you know, what you did, what you did is helpful. This is good. Right. So revenue is such a good metric because it not only like helps you pay the bills and like fund growth and investors like it and you'll be measured against it, but it's also in real time, the market uh, giving you like unbiased, clear feedback on, on what you've built and, and, how, and to what degree it was good. Yeah, well said. The, the next one is a top tip for growth stage founders like yourself. Yeah, you know, I, I saw my Instagram's like full of like motivational clips. They must know that I like I'm an entrepreneur, but I saw a really good clip that, uh, what did it say? It said like, are you afraid that you're going to work really hard and that it's not going to work out? And he goes, and the person goes, because you've met people like this. You've met people that have worked their like butts off for like an extended period of time and it hasn't worked out. He goes, because I don't think you have. I think most people that you meet who have worked really, really hard for a long period of time, they are successful, right? So it's like, you're worried about this thing. So I thought that was a really good clip, but to tie it into like, you know, my own tip here, I would say perseverance um, and just like going like, and just, you know, holding on and having a good intention and a good long-term like be oriented correctly long-term. And I, I say that because I think luck plays a role for sure, but I think luck plays more a role on the timing. I think like if you're going to go build something that has lots of value and it's going to be successful and the world's going in that direction, let's say you get lucky. Like let's say Jim starts something and like, you know, you, you, you do something right at the cusp before a technological, like a huge adoption shift. Maybe, you know, you, you're like, you, you end up being super successful in a short period of time because you got timing right. But let's say you get timing wrong and let's say it takes you longer. Let's say you go three years, five years, seven years in that same business, right? But then eventually the tide shifts and, and you end up benefiting and like, you know, getting all this usage out of it. Well, what was the difference there, right? Well, you know, one person got luckier and the external stuff flipped for them sooner, another one later. But if you just stayed steady and you persevered through it and you were deep in your conviction, I think you can reduce the impact luck can have. So luck has a role for sure. But I think that if you are, on a, you're long-term oriented, you're convicted and you're just like gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna go for it, whether it takes one year or 20 at, at some point, like even, even uh, we were joking yesterday, even the guys from Ask Jeeves, had they stuck out long enough, they'd probably be crushing it now because like this whole like search is going back in that direction, right? Absolutely. So just, just stick it out long enough if you believe and you're convicted. Persevere, persevere. Yeah. All right, right. next one, favorite book or podcast that's helped you to grow as a founder? Yeah, I, I always reference the same the same book. It's the the hard things about hard things by Ben Horowitz. Yeah, like I call it the Bible. Like it's such a good book. I recommend I read anybody. It every year. It's so good and so like good. it's so good. Like we're in wartime now, right? <laughs> um, peacetime, wartime. There, there's so many. The whole like silver. Uh, so there's no silver bullets, but there's lead bullets. Yeah, Ben did such a good job in that book. His his other book's great too, but it's not like it's not it's not the the first one. And he also did such a good job of like I grew up listening to hip hop, and like I, I never kind of like connected the two things. Yeah, so that's that's such a good book. He kills it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. What actor would play you in a movie about your growth? Yeah, it's a funny question. Yeah, some have said we were joking about this with uh, Ben Stiller because of the hair. But <laughs> you know, if you ask me, I'm going to say Ryan Reynolds because he's from Vancouver and I live in Vancouver, and uh, he's better looking than than, <laughs> than Ben Stiller. So I'll yeah, gun in my head, I'm going to say Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, and everyone loves him. I mean, there's I don't think there's yeah. anyone who doesn't like Ryan Reynolds, right? That's right. <laughs> At the point of the filming of this podcast, that is right. And yes, and. <laughs> Must qualify, must qualify. Yeah. All right. Last one here is what is going to be the title of your autobiography when you're all said and done? 
Yeah, I don't, I, I honestly don't think about this stuff at all. But since you, since you asked the question, I, I, I did put like a tiny bit of thought into it. I would say something around like grit and perseverance. And like, I really think it's those two things that make all the difference. I think it's grit and perseverance. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, I think, uh, you, I, I, like, I know luck plays a role. And I think I'm, but I, I'm a big believer that you make your own luck. And yeah, I would say grit and perseverance. You're not often lucky without being good first and without right. perseverance. That's hands down. I believe that too. So you've given so much to our listeners today. So I always like to allow at the end here for a little self-promotion. How can those listening help you out? Yeah, I try not to do a lot of that self-promotion stuff. I mean, if, if, you've, if you're interested in learning about NFTs and digital assets, it's not hard to find us. We're Ethos, um, Ethos NFT on all the handles. LinkedIn is something that we, we spend a lot of time on. So in our website too, ethosnft.com. I would say like the one of the best things I've ever done is kind of given back to other entrepreneurs. Um, and And I would say that if you're having... If you're along your journey and you can help somebody else, you, you should absolutely do it. It's it's such a great thing to do because it'll help you. I've been lucky that in my last company, I was able to kind of help support other young entrepreneurs. And I and I just did it because I was like, I felt like I was pr- like, I could have used the help and that type of thing. But then like what ended up happening, like I ended up building up really great relationships. I ended up getting like my network expanded. I ended up getting like all these opportunities from like just helping other young entrepreneurs. And and the nice thing about that is like, you actually can help. Like if you're two steps ahead of somebody else, you can absolutely help somebody else. So it's like, there's no reason not to do it. And like, often you'll get like equity is like for like helping. And like, then the company, those companies grow. It's like, there's really no reason not to, this is not a zero sum game. And if you have chew class and you've learned some hard lessons, you, you should absolutely help others because it, it does, uh, it does help them. And it, it helps you. I feel like I'm talking to the Canadian version of myself. This is uh, this has been great. It's all it's been it's been real. It's been real, Matthias. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, this has been an absolute joy having you on the dirt. And thanks for sharing your story, man. Cool. Thanks, Jim. Love being on. Take care.